Good morning. Welcome to Authors at Google Cambridge, uh, and welcome to Pride Week. It's my enormous pleasure to kick off Pride Week here in Cambridge by introducing um, four exceptionally talented writers. They happen to be trans women. Uh, they are part of the growing group of topside press writers who are giving voice to people whose voices have long since been denied in the uh, publishing world and who are changing lives even as we stand here. Today we have four writers who are part of the Topside Press Northeastern Tour. Uh, two writers will be back in Cambridge a week from tomorrow the 17th at a location whose name I forget but who Red Durkin can probably remind us of. But this morning we welcome Imogen Binney, Red Durkin, Casey Plett, and Jean Thornton. Imogen Binney writes a monthly column in Maximum Rock and Roll magazine, as well as the zines, the fact that it's funny doesn't make it a joke, and stereotype threat. She was contributor to the Topside Press The Collection, short fiction from the transgender vanguard, which I highly recommend. She was recently named a recipient of the 2014 Betty Burzon Emerging Writer Award. Also, her novel, Nevada, which is available um, in the back of the room after the talk, has been the recent subject of not one, not two, but three video games produced at one of our more presti mo most prestigious uh, engineering universities, Georgia Tech University, alongside uh, another classic of the genre, James Baldwin's Giovanni's Room. Um, so there you have it. If you ever never thought you would see a video game based on Giovanni's Room, uh, I never did. We were both wrong. Red Durkin um, is, for obscure reasons, sadly by default, the prettiest and funniest stand-up comedian in New York City now. <laughs> she, um, <laughs> According to the Canadian border, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> she's also a very talented writer and a um, dogged activist. She is the managing editor of prettyqueer.com. She has written nine zines and was featured in the final issue of Punk Planet magazine and contributed to the collection. Casey Plett has just published a collection of stories, A Safe Girl to Love, the dedication of which is particularly near to my heart. Previously, she wrote a column on transitioning from McSweeney's internet tendency and contributed to the collection. And Jean Thornton is the author of The Black Emerald, which is forthcoming later this year, and The Dream of Dr. Bantam, which was a Lambda Award finalist for 2012, as well as the webcomics Bad Mother and The Man Who Hates Fun. Please join me in welcoming these four very talented writers. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Gene Thornton. So, oh, that's creepy. I don't want to look at that. Wow. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to read you from the beginning of my book, The uh, Dream of Dr. Bantam, um, which is in the back. And let's just go. Let's just get this started. Okay. It's the beginning of the book. You need no context. There's a drawing of an IHOP. It's cool. When Tabitha Thatch argued, her little sister Julie always thought about cats. It was rare that Tabitha argued, much more common that she agreed to rules or demands her mother or the world imposed on her, and then did the opposite of what she'd agreed to. But when she did argue, her jaw relaxed open and her voice, high-pitched and ragged, folded in on itself in a hundred tissue paper layers of connotation, implication, meaning, all of her yelling protest in a way that you couldn't ignore. You could listen to Tabitha yelling, or arguing like a cat for hours. Julie, her own voice like a dog, she thought, short and hoarse and barky, had listened to Tabitha for hours. You could listen and you would be struck by how raw and vibrant that voice was, but then you would realize that 
Tabitha was just saying she was going to go to the mall and buy Adderall to swallow with beer and then hang around the food court talking about the misfits with some college kid. In a raw and vibrant and cat-like way, she would tell you that and you would believe in her. Linda, Tabitha, and Julie's mother had never been vulnerable to Tabitha's voice and Julie had always hated Linda a little bit for that. They were fighting now, Tabs and Linda. Their voices came through the walls of Julie's bedroom like foreign talk radio on the AM dial. Julie sat up at the edge of her bed, recently stripped of its alphabet pattern case and replaced with a more grown up deep green color that reminded her of rainforests. She felt her long hair sticking up in crazy roller coaster loops at the back of her head. The air of the room was somehow just wrong. Like Lucy in Voyage of the Dawn Treader, she had slipped into another dimension, one in which she was not able to get any sleep before her algebra test the next day, one in which the red digital clock was blinking midnight at her in some sick parody of Good Morning. She went into the hallway, still in her white Apple Records t-shirt and boxers, sat on the floor outside Linda's bedroom, curled her legs up to her body, and listened to them. Everything has to have a reason. That's your problem, Tabitha was saying. What if my reason is that I just want to spend all day lying in a field or something and writing long letters to ex-boyfriends? What if that's my reason? I don't give a shit what your reason is, Linda, says. Linda said. I don't care how boring or irrelevant you think your classes are either. You think I don't spend eight or nine hours a day doing boring and irrelevant stuff? I think you're spending right now doing boring and irrelevant stuff, said Tabitha. Does right now count toward those eight or nine hours? It's called survival, said Linda. You do what you have to in order to survive. It's not called fun or quit school so I could go out with boys and work at a fucking video arcade and smoke pot in the house all day. At least smoke pot in the garage. I'm an adult, said Tabitha. I can possibly make decisions without subjecting them to some neurotic process of analysis about what might possibly go wrong. You're 17, said Linda. And the video arcade is a good job, said Tabitha, mother. Linda laughed. Jilly buried her cheeks deeper into her bare bony knees. There are no good jobs, Linda said. There are only lucrative jobs that you hate. Your job is neither lucrative nor do you hate it. I'll move out, said Tabitha. That got a laugh, that's cool. I like this place. Okay. I'll move out, said Tabitha. I'll move out and maybe Julie will come with me and you won't have us hanging around all the time making your life miserable. You're stoned, said Linda. I'm not gonna argue with you while you're stoned. Ew, you're stoned, said Tabitha. Get out of my room, said Linda. Go to bed and you're going back to school in the morning. You're gonna tell them you changed your mind about leaving. Ew, get out of my room, said Tabitha. The TV came on immediately, some infomercial. There was a snort and then a stomp, and then Julie's eyes were blinded by the lamplight. Tabitha stormed into the hallway and slammed the door behind her. She turned and her eyes fell into the ball of Julie at her feet. She stopped before her sister. What the fuck are you doing in the hallway, she asked. Were you spying on us? Yes, Julie said. Tabitha stared down at her. Julie stared back up. When Tabitha got like this, you could not be reasonable. You only had to match her crazy for crazy. Even in the dark hallway, Julie thought her older sister was very beautiful. Her hair, hay blonde like Julie's, bleached and highlighted in pink like celery stalks in red water. Her skirt torn, her stocking striped, her, skirt, her shirt full of rhinestones like the constellations that Julie liked to memorize from books and try to see through the fluorescent haze of Austin streetlights. The rhinestones spelled out no future. Tabitha put her hands on her hips and pursed her mouth. Her lips were painted in red and outlined in black the epaulets of her leather jacket rose and fell as she breathed. Come on, Tabitha said, let's get out of here. Where are we going, Julie asked. Anywhere but here, said Tabitha. I don't know, we'll get pancakes, come on. <laughs> Julie got up, the shoulders of her t-shirt nearly even with Tabitha's epaulets. Somehow at 13, she had become as tall as her sister when she wasn't paying attention. Let me go get dressed, she asked. You'll take forever, said Tabitha. Come on, trust me, let's just go, it's the millennium. Julie's flip-flops were stacked under the coat rack by the door. She put them on and followed Tabitha out into the front yard, across the lawn, in her Apple Records t-shirt and boxers. Her legs shivered in the spring night, and every window in every neighbor's house could have been an eyeball. She got into the car next to her sister. She lit a cigarette, a tulip of fire surrounded by the black petals of her painted nails. Against the light, her eyes were red at the edges. She turned the key. They didn't talk as they drove down 2222 and merged onto the highway, bearing south, one of Tabitha's smashing pumpkin CDs was blaring quietly. Tabitha tossed her filter out the window, licked her lips, and then looked over at Julie. Shit, she said, I can't take you to get pancakes in your boxers. I must be losing my mind. 
She giggled again, and she veered off the highway, throwing Julie's shoulders against the seatbelt. Be careful, Julie hissed. They fishtailed under the overpass. The CD played on. Tabitha flicked her blinkers off and on in time with it while Julie stared at her, dug her nails into her seat. They pulled into the parking lot of an all-night Walmart. Tabitha opened the door and swung her legs out. What are we doing here, Julie said. What dress size are you, said Tabitha. I have no idea, said Julie. Can we just go home? No, said Tabitha happily. Come on, guess. You have to know your dress size. Four, Julie guessed. Four, nodded Tabitha. She took the keys out of the ignition, tossed them to Julie, and shut the door. You can listen to the CD if you want, she said. Just, if you do, um, leave the window rolled down a little. Otherwise, gases and stuff will come in from the engine and they'll kill you. She gave a two-finger Cub Scout salute and then jogged off toward the store. Julie sat alone in the car for a minute, listening to the engine uh, creak and settle and needing to pee. And then she picked up the keys and turned on the CD player. There was a new song, Quiet and Creepy. A man was pushing a shopping cart filled with bulky trash bags near the curb by the dark part at the edge of the store, a gray hood bunched up around his skull. She looked at the window, half rolled down, and wondered if you could smell the gas from the engine killing you, and if the sleepiness she felt in her temples meant that it might already be too late. She turned off the CD, but that only made the dread worse, and she couldn't figure out how to turn it back on. You took forever, she said to Tabitha when her sister hustled back into the car and handed her a white, fat white shopping bag. Size four, said Tabitha. Put them on. There was a pair of jeans in the bag. Where am I supposed to put them on, asked Julie. Jesus, said Tabitha. The back seat? Where else do you change clothes in a car? Julie tapped her fingers against the bag and then clambered between the seats. The leather in the back reeked of pot and incense, and she stretched her legs out over the piles of forgotten school papers that filled up Tabitha's car. A skeleton keychain, long abandoned, dug into her behind. The windows are open, she said. Right, said Tabitha. People only notice parked cars if the windows get all fogged up, so even though it may seem like the exact wrong thing to do, if you're getting, like, physical with a boy, you'll want to leave the windows open. Remember that. You're stupid and stoned, said Julie. I'm never getting physical with a boy. With a girl, then, Tabitha shrugged. Whatever. It's the millennium. <laughs> Julie flushed in the dark. You're stoned, she repeated. Then she closed her eyes. She pretended that she was not sitting in a parked car with her sister, and she shrugged off her boxers. She hurried the new jeans on, arched her back to struggle with the last two inches of hip and the snaps. They're too tight, she breathed. Size for my ass, said Tabitha. Come on, squeeze them in there. She still managed it, snapped, zipped, tried to breathe, and succeeded. She sat up, still okay. She opened the door and began to circle the car, walking the pants on. The jeans were boot cut, screen printed neon flames rising from the cuffs. She winced as her bare soles pushed against the cracked glass asphalt. She was walking commando through a parking lot at night in tight jeans she had just gone out and bought with her sister. Why not? Snap, like that. And Tabitha was behind the wheel, stoned and fiddling with the CD player, giving her a thumbs up and nodding in time with Cherub Rock out of the speakers. And she looked at her sister and she loved her. You like them, asked Tabitha. They're not like cutting off circulation in your legs. They're the best pants ever, Julie said. You make them work, said Tabitha. Come on, let's get pancakes. And so they pulled out of the parking lot and onto the highway like a jet screaming in takeoff, a jet that sounded like Billy Corgan and stank like an ashtray at a Renaissance fair. And Julie decided that there would never be a better moment than this in her entire life. Thank you all very much. Um, my name is Red Durkin. Um, I've got about an hour's sleep in me, um, so this will be fun. It'll be great. Um, also, yeah, I, I, I was interested. I'm a comedian, but my writing is really not very funny. So um, I'm going to read uh, my story from the collection, which uh, is titled A Roman Incident. Um, and all you need to know about that is that it's the term for when somebody throws up during an eating contest. <laughs> Um, to Charlie's immediate left stood a man who had once eaten 21 pounds of grits in 10 minutes. All along the table in front of her, clad in the same free t-shirt she wore, adventurous amateurs stood shoulder to shoulder with vetted professionals who made their living rushing down enough food to kill civilians. Charlie prayed, oh jeez, ah, it went away. All right, I'll try to not let that happen again, sorry. Um, 
Charlie prayed that in 10 short minutes she'd have earned a place in the fellowship of the latter. Icy terror filled her empty stomach. She could afford to lose some of her nerve, but none of her appetite. She closed her eyes and counted down from 10. At zero, the world completely exploded. Lights flashed, buzzers blared, and a crowd of thousands, surging like a boar tide, crashed into the security gate. Their cacophonous excitement splashed onto the stage along with waves of their beer. Charlie was face down in her fourth mouthful of chicken when Pavlovian reflex gave way to human awareness and she realized what was happening. The Hooters World Wing Eating Championship had begun. Her destiny was at the, bo at the bottom of the pile of poultry parts in front of her. She couldn't afford to be reckless. Every wing had to be clean in order to count, so she quickly rendered each one to polished bone before moving on to the next. Behind her, a gorgeous girl in emphatically tight orange shirt shorts held a scorecard above her head. The woman bounced and smiled and cheered, faking her enthusiasm the way Charlie imagined her mother had taught her. In part of her heart, Charlie would always bear a hateful jealousy for women like this. She begrudged them their big, friendly breasts, their happily bulging hips, all the legible parts of their bodies that spoke woman in every language. Charlie's inscrutable frame would never carry that confident kind of currency, and she scorned the pretty girls for their oblivious luck. When she was nine, she'd posted a note on the fridge that said, Charlie is a girl and she needs new clothes. Um, oh God, now what's this doing? <laughs> Will you save me? Oh yeah, that's weird. Do y'all know anything about like technology? <laughs> <laughs> is, this, is this a tech savvy crowd? Okay, we should be good. Okay, great. We had a Thank you. Um, so, uh, to <laughs> recover a little bit, uh, Charlie hates pretty girls. <laughs> um, when she was nine, she'd posted a note on the fridge that said, Charlie is a girl and she needs new clothes. End of discussion. Some years earlier, to get out of an intervention, Charlie's father had declared that the words end of discussion meant exactly that in the Eaglehorn household. It was family law. The phrase had been employed when she was 12 and demanded to go on hormones, and most recently at 17 when she declared her intention of becoming a professional speed eater. One minute down, one bowl of wings eaten. Charlie's heart kicked like a mule. Anxiety throbbed in her temple. Her jaw stiffened too quickly. She knew if she didn't calm down and steady her pace, she'd be lucky to finish it all, but she was operating on a level baser than prudence. It was the reptile part of her brain that was grabbing and chewing and swallowing. She couldn't hear the sloppy roar of the crowd or the glut grunting gluttony of the competition. Like the few other women on stage, she was pelted with the countless ugly words for girl that fly so easily from the mouths of angry, drunken men. She blocked it out. She'd had practice. Tears and snot gushed down her face. She was soaked in a marinade of sweat and buffalo sauce. Grab, chew, swallow. Each spicy wing tasted more like sty styrofoam and her cheeks bulged with unchewed meat. Every bedraggled second took a lifetime to pass. It was beginning to feel like home. She'd been raised by a pair of New England hippies who'd moved to Alabama because they liked the leaves in, autumns in, in autumn and equated dirt roads with rustic honesty. The Eaglehorn settled in a truck stop town outside of Montgomery called Hope Hole, which was an appropriate name for a place so utterly gutted of anything worth looking forward to. Oh my god, it just did it again. So I, cho I chose to read this story because my other stories were really gross and upsetting, and now I'm like, oh, it should have just been gross and upsetting. All right. The Eaglehorn settled in a truck stop town outside of Montgomery called Hope Hole, which was an appropriate name of, for a place so utterly gutted of anything worth looking forward to. The Charlie is a Girl campaign had been one of the most successful political movements in its entire history. As a homeschooled hippie whelp growing out up on the fringes of an outskirt town, she was practically invisible to anyone who didn't share their meals with her. Between her mother's homestyle lopsided haircuts and her father's surprisingly successful approach to homeopathic endocrinology, those lucky enough to lay eyes on her were neither certain of nor curious about what they were looking at. Her parents claimed her as their daughter, and so long as you didn't have the audacity to dye your hair pink or the nerve to be dark-skinned, Hope Hole's residents were a proudly credulous bunch. Charlie suddenly realized she couldn't remember the last time she'd taken oxygen into her lungs. She wondered how long her animal mind had been screaming. All the pain and confusion she'd foisted on it were immediately hers to deal with again. 
Four more minutes had passed, four and a half more bowls, 55 wings in all. The top half of her body was covered in gore. Her jaw glowed white hot with pain, her esophagus burning with the sensation of being strangled from the inside out. She tried to swallow, but the blockage in her throat only shuffled in place. She snatched a cup of water from the table and gulped it down. The lump lurched mercifully. As it finally moved to take its right, rightful place in her stomach, she gasped a great mouthful of air, and the agony all over her body began to register on an all-too-conscious level. Her fingers hurt. She took another deep breath and closed her eyes. She forced herself to master the pain. She refused to go back to hustling arrogant rednecks at the off-ramp burger joints that composed Hope Hole's economy. At once, at one time, those moments had been proud and meaningful victories. Now, they felt more like the glory day nails in her inevitably mediocre coffin. She was willing to eat her way out of that shit splat town, even if it killed her. She picked up another wing just in time to catch a blur of green glass in her periphery. The bottle cracked her just above the eye and everything went white in an instant. Charlie had been hit before, of course. By her mid-teens, she traded her beanpole adolescent androgyny for a sexlessly amorphous obesity. To the idle and idiot youth of Hope Hole, Charlie was a chimera of cardinal social sins. She was fat, opinionated, and ineffably weird looking. She had the disturbing habit of reading for pleasure, and her free-spirited Yankee kin might as well have been Martians. The girls spit in her hair and laughed at her back. The boys called her a faggot because she confused them. They punched her, she punched back, and slowly they all learned how to fight together. Her sole companion was a pig-nosed girl named Lulu, who brazenly forced the friendship to garner disapproval from her pig-faced family. In fluttering flashes, the world began to focus. She'd staggered back from the table, but was still in the competition. Precious seconds had been lost to semi-consciousness, and she warded off wary medics to keep from losing more. The red in her eye might well have been buffalo sauce. Her throbbing head reminded her of home. She wanted to sleep. She needed to eat. She split the difference and looked around. Four more minutes to go and only eight of the original 20 com com competitors still stood on the line. For the first time, she could see that just past the gris grits eater and a bloated man wearing novelty sunglasses stood Sonia Thomas, the Black Widow. She was a svelte Korean-born woman who had managed a Burger King before becoming the second highest ranked gurgitator on Earth. She held a dozen world records and, according to the scoreboard, a chicken wing that would put her 26 points out of reach. Charlie's stomach suddenly felt like a much smaller place. Somewhere outside of her body, she could see herself chewing again. She had never planned on beating Sonia Thomas. She had only prayed she, sh she wouldn't show up. Some people want to kill their idols, but Charlie didn't want a fight. She just wanted to get out of Alabama. A mechanical waltz settled over her body. Grab, chew, swallow. She struggled to, to distract herself from the replete pain and doubt welling up in her guts. She thought back to home and the perpetual motion of her life as a podunk pariah. In the dregs of her diffidence, she knew that she'd fed the beast, had let the hurt go deeper than skin, and had grown fatter, weirder, even meaner as a result. She'd craved the hard touch of a town that would never claim her as their own, never love her, never brag about her. Her hope had been shining through an ever-clenching pinhole, but in that lens, she'd seen the widow competing on television. Charlie recognized her kindred in strife, another misfit among rubes. She saw in Sonia Thomas a whisper of freedom, a liberty to dance on the edge of womanhood and thrive. Charlie's training had started the spring she turned 17. Her parents met her intentions of becoming a major league eater with a skepticism bordering hostility. 17 years of semi-responsible parenting had severely moderated the Eaglehorn idea of acceptable life goals. Really, they worried that their chronically unpopular daughter's plan to etch a living shoving food down her throat was a proposition in suicide. She'd had to declare the discussion ended more than once. In fact, she'd never been further from death. Her regimen was modeled on what she could glean from her idol's sporadic television appearances and the internet. It was surprisingly in step with the recommendations of modern medicine. Eight hours of sleep a night, daily jogs, and a strict 1,700-calorie diet filled with fruits and vegetables.
Of course, eating all that food at once isn't in many fitness manuals, to say nothing of her bi-weekly all-you-can-eat workouts. But the overall improvement in Charlie's health was undeniable. By the fall, she'd lost 78 pounds and gained the beauty and confidence of a girl who truly believes she has control over food. Her public enthusiasm of eating competitions did her few favors with her peers, but her reclaimed featherweight kilter and the off-brand hormones her father bought online had given her a peculiar prettiness that at least kept boys from throwing rocks at her. Her friendship remained a social pitfall Lulu alone was willing to risk. With 30 seconds left, something was very wrong and getting worse. The 83 wings she'd somehow swallowed were now in open revolt. Terror tied a knot in her stomach, making her nausea feel all the more urgent. She'd eaten beyond her means. Charlie was going to throw up. Her breath came in shallow gulps. She wobbled drunkenly as her strength began to break and she closed her eyes. Clammy certainty enveloped her. Vomiting was intractable and inevitable, but desperately needed to be stalled. If a drop of her sick touched the table before the clock ran out, she'd be disqualified. A great wave of adrenaline washed up the last bit of re resolve she'd so jealously buried. It was immediately followed by the half-digested ambitions at the back of her throat. Charlie's hand shot to her mouth. A gleeful explosion of pleasure roared out of the voyeuristic crowd. Her shoulders heaved as though she'd been shoved by an invisible hand and she teetered slightly forward. The drool in her mouth tasted like batteries. The mess in her guts came flooding out over her lips and into her waiting palms. She shuddered violently as she buckled and began to fall. The final buzzer screamed out over the chaos. The championship was over. Charlie's world strobed into blackness and she collapsed unconscious into a pile of puke and victory. In her hallucinations, Charlie watched the Big Bang spew forth and begin to eat itself. She perceived a cycle of consumption, the tidal glut of energy that crushes stars and digests the cosmos. At the center of each galaxy sat an endlessly hungry mouth, a black hole that bolted down creation and waited for the final buzzer of doomsday. Serenely, she recognized creation as an elaborate eating contest. The thought made her happy. She woke up to the bright white glow of tarp in the sunshine. Her head lay on a starched, sterile pillow, and a clear tube of saline dripped into a vein in the crook of her elbow. The ebullient bustle of post-competition commotion outside told her that she'd been unconscious for only a few minutes, though she felt like she'd witnessed eternity. Sitting up drew the relieved attention of a kind-faced young medic on the other side of the tent. Her heart fluttered, her head throbbed, and he urged her to lie back down. She'd almost died. It was time to rest. In a photo finish, Charlie's vomit had stayed in her hands and off the table until after the buzzer. The rules were clear. She'd officially finished successfully. Charlie was awarded third place, just five wings shy of the grits guy. On the plastic stool next to her cot, paper clipped to a $500 check and a handful of Hooters coupons, was a business card with the International Federation of Competitive Eaters logo on it. She grinned, grinned deliriously, belched, and fell asleep. Thank you. Hey. It's always awesome to watch the people who kind of lose their shit during that story. Um, I've seen Red read that a lot of times. It's nice. Uh, my name is Imogen Binney. This is a novel called Nevada that I wrote that just lost at the Lambda Literary Awards. Um, it's a story, it's in two parts. Uh, the first is about a trans woman living in New York City who is a mess, who loses her girlfriend and her job. In the second part, um, she sort of half borrows, half steals her now ex-girlfriend's car and points it west, where she winds up at a Walmart in a small town in Nevada where she sees a kid. She's in her late 20s, she sees this kid and she's like, ah, you're 19 and I know you, you are trans and you don't know it yet. I'm gonna fucking, I'm gonna fix that for you. Um, and he's like, I don't, I don't know about that. Um, it's a story of non-consensual mentorship. Um, and so what I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read a part from the first half of it and then a part from the second half of it when they meet. Um, where am I? I am. Um, 
So the part, the first part I'm going to read, she has broken up with her girlfriend. Her girlfriend broke up with her a little bit ago, and she just was fired for her job because she works at uh, the Strand. Do you know the, the Strand in New York City? She works at a bookstore. She tends to kind of just leave and walk around Lower Manhattan on the clock. Um, so she's just been fired for that, and that's that. You could be melodramatic and say, just like that, Maria Griffiths is homeless and unemployed in New York City. The reality, though, is that she has, had a, or she has a bunch of places to crash, so it would be appropriative to call herself homeless. OK, she says, great, I'm just going to grab my stuff from the back, and then I'll be on my way. She is in the process of being fired. OK, she says, great, I'm just going to grab my stuff from the back, and I'll be on my way, all cheerful. Someone will bring you your things, McNeely says. McNeely is an angry, obviously, supervisor who is in the process of firing her. Uh, McNeely says, you're really not going to let me go back to the closet to get my bag? You don't work here anymore, he says, looking off to one side, already bored with this conversation. Some new kid brings her bag up. They must have watched her leave and prepared for this. Awkward, but whatever. Once again, her response surprises her. She's kind of excited. She laughs in the old fucker's face, takes her bag, and walks back into the rain. She practically knocks over the terrifying owner of the store who has just arrived in a cab or a car service or whatever, right on time for work. I'm not going to read this section for YouTube. <laughs> yeah, wow, that's a lot of stuff I don't want to read on YouTube. Um, Maria starts immediately to regret that she didn't get a jab in, but whatever. She's outside in the rain, and she's got the whole afternoon to herself, the whole week, actually. It hits her again that she's pretty excited not to have a job anymore, even though that means no more money until she can find another one and no more health insurance. Who cares? She never has to go back to that job she was so indifferent about for so long because she absolutely, completely hates her life in New York. Whoa. Sometimes, your internal monologue surprises you. She thinks about going back to the apartment she is probably still, st still sharing with Steph, but seeing all Steph's things would probably be kind of rough right now. Then she thinks about going to hang out with Piranha. Uh, her best friend is named Piranha. She thinks about going to hang out with Piranha, but she is probably going to be asking Piranha if she can crash at her house a lot pretty soon, so she had better not just start taking up space there immediately. She could go see a movie, but suddenly being broke is a lot more real than it was a couple hours ago, and $10 for a two-hour distraction seems irresponsible. Like, bad irresponsible. She decides to go to alt.coffee. It is this biggish coffee shop on Avenue A where they have computers and stuff, but also couches and expensive coffee and atmosphere. It's cooler than the coffee shop by the bookstore, like in a gentrification sense. Uh, as a last app of ep act of epic, brutal punk rock defiance, she steps two feet back into the door of the bookstore and grabs an umbrella out of the umbrella basket. Ha! She leaves her bike chained up outside the bookstore, under the awning where it'll stay dry, and walks the six long blocks to Avenue A. It's so gray out. It rules. This has been her favorite kind of weather since she was a little kid. She loves going inside after being in the rain when you're kind of wet and cold, but you immediately start warming up, and you finally start to feel just how wet you are as soon as you start to dry out. And then you can look outside and see the rain, watch it run down the windows, and nobody can realistically ask you to go outside and play. New Yorkers walk by and ignore her. Cabs splash puddle water everywhere. Nobody waits for the don't walk sign to turn to walk before they cross the street. Rain looks like it's freezing to the frail branches of the city trees. Maybe the rain will start to freeze, turn the sidewalks icy. It's fall, so it might happen, but it's very early fall, so it might not. This umbrella is enormous, and it's got a Nike logo on it. Punk rock indeed, Batman. She's been calling herself Batman in her internal monologue. It's pretty wise. Punk rock indeed, Batman, she says to herself as she retracts the umbrella and goes into the hip coffee shop. They have an umbrella bucket, and she worries for a second about whether someone will steal her umbrella, then laughs at herself. Who cares? It'd probably do her some good for somebody to steal her stolen umbrella so she would have to walk back to her bike in the rain. She thinks about how good a hot shower feels when you're soaked in cold rain. Here's the thing. She's been thinking a lot about knuckle tattoos and how if you have eight letters, you can make a knuckle tattoo. The next line is umbrella, she thinks, but it is spelled out in blocks of four letters so as to appear in the shape of knuckle tattoos. She's thinking about having the word umbrella tattooed on her knuckles. <laughs> She didn't bring a book, and she doesn't really know what she's going to do at the coffee shop. Spend money on internet access to look at help wanted ads on Craigslist? Her resume from years ago is probably somewhere in her email. She could update it to include this most recent job, act like she left without being fired, lie, and say a friend is a manager who thinks she was a great employee. She can use her real name, not her legal one, and just not freak out about it if anybody asks. Just tell them she's trans at the interview, if she gets an interview. That way, it'll be out in the open, at least with the management at her new job, which will be as somebody's assistant at a publishing company or something. She gets a $3 drip coffee and gives the barista her license. 
She doesn't look at it, but she's got dyke hair, so she probably wouldn't care if she saw the M. Maria is assigned computer number 23, but after 15 minutes of looking at Craigslist, her eyes glaze over and she is falling asleep sitting up. She doesn't have the energy to email that girl. She does not feel like job searching. She's like, do I even want to stay in New York? She doesn't actually have to. She goes back up to, a, uh, to the counter, tells the girl that she is done on the computer and gets her license back. Five dollars for 15 minutes. She takes her coffee over to a couch, sits down and takes out her notebook. October 15th, part three. I hate New York, but I love the New York rain in autumn, like the November rain. But it is October, and I just got fired from the stupid bookstore. I didn't even cuss out anybody. Now I have to figure out what the fuck to do with myself. Do I get a new job in Brooklyn near my apartment? Except I'm gonna have to find another apartment, too. I am exhausted from thinking about being trans all the time, and I wish I could stop. If you work for the city of San Francisco, dear diary, did you know that they will pay for bottom surgery for you? It might be an urban legend. Maybe I will look into it. It didn't even occur to me to go out and get drunk after I got fired, which is interesting. It's almost like I got drunk all the time when I was dating Steph and working a shitty job, not because I am a total addict, but because it was a coping mechanism to deal with being unhappy. Her hand hurts already. It sucks that being from the computer generation means she cannot write longhand, like, at all. She texts Piranha, can I stay with you again tonight? Got fired a little. She puts the phone back in her pocket. She puts the phone back in her pocket, but it rings immediately. It's Piranha. She stands up and goes outside because who cares what everybody else does? Who cares that there are only three other people in the coffee shop at 2 p.m. on a Wednesday? It is rude to talk on your phone when other people are trying to concentrate. Dude, Piranha says. Hi, Maria says, maybe more cheerful than she actually is. I'm working tonight, but you can come get the key from me at work and stay at my house while I'm out and like take a shower or whatever. Thanks, Maria says. But listen, you can't just stay at my house all the time, you know? Yeah. I was, Piranha cuts her off. I know you know, but it's like, dude, Maria, besides the occasional text, I hear from you once every two or three months because you're so occupied with your girlfriend all the time. And now, suddenly, you want to hang out all day every day because you don't have to worry about her anymore? That feels kind of fucked to me. Shit. Yeah. I, no, listen, Piranha says, I'm not going to put you out on the street, especially if you just got fired from work, and I want, I want you to tell me all about that. I'm not super pissed at you or anything. I just need you to understand that I feel kind of resentful about the fact that you've ignored me pretty bad for so long, and now that you've got a reason besides that you're excited to hang out with me, suddenly we are besties or whatever. Okay, Maria says, probably hurt the most deeply that she's been in these last couple of days. I miss you, Piranha says, and I'm excited to see you again, but I needed to put that out there. I've got to go to work at nine. Come see me then, okay? Yeah, Maria says, okay. They hang up. Now her mood has come back to earth and she feels like shit. Maybe she should get a beer. Turns out they have two for one beers at, after four at Hi-Fi half a block away, but Maria doesn't wait until four. Then when four o'clock hits, she has her third and fourth beers and falls asleep on the bar for a couple hours. Who knows why the skinny, pretty bartender lets her sleep? That's kind of off limits at most bars. Maybe having a transsexual pass out at your bar for a couple hours is the kind of gritty authenticity that a bar on the Lower East Side needs now that everybody has moved to Brooklyn. <laughs> so that's the first part I'm gonna read. Uh, this next is, section is from the perspective of James, who is 19. He is smoking a lot of weed, so he doesn't have to think about gender or have any feelings about gender. Um, he smokes out before he gets to work, but by hour four or so of a nine-hour shift, he is not really feeling stoned anymore. Every day, by this point, he mostly feels tired and pissed off. He's always wished he could be the kind of cool badass who smokes out at work, but there is no way you could do it with some, without somebody finding out. Plus, his mom rides in his car sometimes, so you can't even hotbox it ever. It's actually very possible that this is why he hates his job so much. He's like, I should think about that. Every single day I go through an unstonedening and fucking hate my life and my job and my house and my girlfriend and everyone and everything that I can see. It seems like that probably affects my job satisfaction. <laughs> I end each shift with a headache. I need a fix because I am addicted to the she-demon marijuana. It is getting toward the end of his shift, and James isn't stoned anymore, and it sucks. This old guy who comes in once or twice a week was looking for some stupid old movies that he couldn't find because Walmart does not carry stupid old movies, but this guy doesn't listen to James at all, so they always wind up spending half an hour pretending to look for these DVDs that are not there. That's probably a metaphor for life in Star City, actually. Whatever. Once or twice a week, James thinks very seriously about writing out a note to have waiting for this guy the next time he comes in that explains that these are very, very old and hokey movies starring actors that nobody cares about anymore and that he would be better off going to the Family Dollar over in Imlay where they sell those mass-produced DVDs of public domain stuff that feel all light in your hands like there's no DVD in them. Walmart can't even order them. 
Those DVD companies have their own distributors that Walmart doesn't use, which is weird, since it seems like the distributors that make those wholesome DVDs would be Christian, and Walmart doesn't shy away from Christian anything. But whatever, who cares? James has a headache, he needs to smoke out again, and this old guy is starting to seem done with playing out this scenario yet again, when Maria Griffiths comes strutting up the aisle of the Walmart looking out of place as hell like she is made out of long red hair and layers of clothing. James does what anybody would do when they see somebody they would like to know. He ignores the shit out of her. Probably he freaks out a little, but she came right to the music and movies section, so what else could he do? He says hi to her when she first comes in because he can get in trouble if he doesn't. According to Walmart corporate policy, greetings turn thieves into friends. <laughs> But then he just ignores her as hell. Maybe on some level he notices that she might have looked for him, or looked at him for a second longer than was appropriate, but if he half thinks anything, it's like, suck it up, dude, that girl is definitely not checking you out. She's wearing more clothes than he has ever seen anyone wear at once. Huge black boots, a long black skirt or maybe a dress, what looks like a shorter dark orange skirt on top of it, a long maroonish sweater under a ratty denim jacket with a bunch of patches and buttons on it, a black scarf and wavy, dried out looking hair just past her shoulders. Her hair is almost exactly the same color as her sweater, but a little bit darker. They probably clash or whatever. Her clothes look like she slept in them. There are permanent looking crinkles in the elbows of her jacket and her hair looks like it would leave a mark if she leaned her head against a wall. She looks like she's probably a rock star or a murderer. One time, the band, one time, the band Creed came to his Walmart on tour to buy batteries or something and everybody flipped out even though Creed is a stupid band. But James saw one of the guys from the band and he walked with this magnetism or swagger or something like he knew he was a big deal. And Maria carries herself kind of the same way. She walks over to the pop slash rock CD display and James thinks clearly, who the fuck wears a scarf in the daytime in Star City, especially during a heat wave? While he is ignoring her, he stares at her back. This is good, I bet Google people will get this, ready? Who the fuck uh, wears a scarf in the daytime in Star City, especially during a heat wave? While he is ignoring her, he stares at her back. Steven Tyler, the fourth doctor. Yeah, <laughs> great. There's always like one or two people who are like, you didn't just, cool. <laughs> The fourth doc, it's a Doctor Who illusion. James watches a lot of TV. He is seriously just being a creep and staring at her because people who look like that do not live here. They don't stop here while they're driving through either. There are other Walmarts closer to the highway, like three exits away in either direction. It was fucking dumb for Walmart to put a Walmart here. Well, nobody comes here except for Creed once. <laughs> She flips through the pop slash rock CDs for a second and James manages to look away from the poison patch safety pinned across her back and the messy wavy hair sprawling its way down it. Like, Poison, the glam rock band with the singer who does reality TV shows now? His headache fades or else James just forgets about it because when she turns around, he's very intently alphabetizing CDs that have just come in and need to be shelved. Hey, she says, looking him up and down again. James is like, hi. Do you have the Miranda Lambert album? Um, he says, probably, but it's probably in the country section. She's like, oh, there's a country section? And he's like, well, yeah. Then, because he was feeling totally weird, James doesn't even stop himself. He just blurts out, you don't look like the folks who usually shop there, though. Because if he is being totally honest with himself on some level, James has already figured out that this girl is trans, and while he hasn't processed what that means yet, he is having this desperate, magnetic attraction to her. Like, not even sexual, just like, I want to be your Facebook friend. I need to grab you, to have you in my life, whatever. You don't look like the folks who usually shop here. That is a pretty dumb thing to say, but she doesn't disagree. She looks at his name tag, smirks, and says, that's probably true, James H., but check this out. I left New York City about a week ago, and my dog, my cat, and I have been living out of my car since then, driving out to the West Coast solely because we have never seen it. In New York City, there are Spanish music stations, rap stations, dumb rock stations, and little stations run by painfully self-aware college students with no idea what to do with all their privilege besides collect records and gentrify neighborhoods that have been fine for generations. <laughs> but I don't think there's a country station in New York. I guess there are a lot of reggaeton stations, which in a lot of ways people tend to not even notice has a lot of similarities to country music. By the way, people have asked me, oh yeah, how is reggaeton similar to country? It's not, this is Maria being an idiot. <laughs> anyway, it turns out though, that once you leave New York, which nobody should ever do, haha, <laughs> JK, the only things you can... <laughs> The only things you can consistently get on a 12-year-old car stereo are NPR and country stations. And have you ever listened to NPR? It's soothing for a while, but eventually it makes you want to call in and cuss somebody out until you cry. 
It wouldn't get onto the radio because I guess they have enough lag time to dump out angry people who call up and lose their shit. But it turned me off NPR for a while, which means country station after country station for the last four days. And look, I am not some New York jerk who thinks country music is for yokels or something. I'm into it. I get it. I even think it's kind of nice that country singers are so fucking convinced of their own sincerity that they don't do any of the tortured artist, I don't care if you'd like me, it's art, man, posturing that all the indie rock kids do. And they don't spend all day telling me about how tough and rich they are like the rappers on the radio do, except James H. There is also a lot of dumb shit on country radio. I'm so much cooler online. She thinks my tractor is sexy. I guess it's funny the first time, but, but, Maria has followed James over to the country music section and is jabbing her pointer finger toward his chest. I guess, she says, Miranda Lambert isn't the biggest star in the country sky because I've only heard the radio play her a couple times, but I think all her songs are about like burning down cheating ex-boyfriends' houses and like shooting your abusive ex in the face. The first time I heard that song, I was like, finally, someone is just coming out and threatening to, threatening to kill her asshole boyfriend right there on the radio. Not that I think anybody should kill anybody else or anything, but after five days of country radio, consider me brainwashed. Miranda Lambert, James H, is the punkest shit on the radio, and I'm going to drive my car off a cliff if I hear the song about how the guy hopes he gets a chance to live like he was dying ever again. Not because I don't like it, because it is so sad and true that it makes me want to live like I was dying and then die. So James H, Miranda Lambert is a contingency plan to save my life. She actually said the internet abbreviation for just kidding out loud. <laughs> There's a pause and then she smirks and she's like, sorry, I haven't really talked to anybody in a while. James is like, it's cool. He picks up Miranda's, Miranda Lambert's second album and hands it to her. This is the CD with that song about the gunpowder and lead on it, he says. Thank you, James H. She says, you've been very helpful. Then she starts to leave the movies and CDs department. Wait, James says, you've got to buy it here or else security will kick my ass. This is kind of true, mostly true. You're supposed to get people to buy their music and DVDs in the music and DVDs section. Even though there isn't like a rule about it, it's a firm suggestion in the interest of loss prevention. But it is a stupid thing to emphasize just then. It's not like he's gonna slipper his phone number on the receipt. Well, the receipt does have the phone number for Walmart number 8304 on it if she wants to call him. I don't think they could take you, she says. You look like a total bruiser. Yeah, he says, totally. I'm a regular old Brad Paisley. We were just talking about Brad Paisley in the car before. Brad Paisley is great. I'm a regular old Brad Paisley. Which one is Brad Paisley? You know, he says, I don't highlight my hair and I've still got a pair. Maria's eyes light up and she quotes from this dumb country song. My eyebrows ain't plucked and there's a gun in my truck. That's me, he says, honey, I'm still a guy. It's $10.90. The weirdness of that exchange is not lost on either of them. Maria pays with a debit card. James notices that her pin is 6664. Then she leaves and he thinks, well, Fuck. Then his headache is back and he gets pretty bummed, so he starts thinking about how like soon he's gonna go home and get high as fuck. Smoking weed rules, and the fact that this girl just showed up in his life and now she is gone forever totally sucks. He's thinking about this weird girl who is just here whose name he doesn't even know because she paid with a pen instead of credit, and then his thoughts naturally and optimistically turn to his go-to non-sexual fantasy, weed. He isn't... <laughs> He's envisioning like laying down in the sprawling fields of the marijuana farms of Northern California, but she keeps stomping in. Even though it is go-to fantasy, even though it is his go-to fantasy, James is aware that it is pretty boring. More interesting things tend to intrude, like fantasizing about laying down in a field of weed crops. It's like licking the centerfold of an issue of high times. He just keeps thinking like New York City, her and a dog and a cat in a car for a week. What the fuck is reggaeton? <laughs> Trans. It's weird that he could tell that she was trans. You could tell, but not in like an obvious way. Like if a drag queen came parading up the aisle, you couldn't really tell from the way she looked or the way she talked or anything, probably. But then you have to ask yourself, like, well, how could I tell? It was probably some combination of things, but could other people tell? Was he going to have that, or was he going to have to have stupid conversations for the next three months with idiot coworkers about the freaky queer that was in the store that one time? Gross. Weird. Thank you. Hey, hi everyone. Um, I'm Casey Platt. I'm the last one. Um, I'm going to read um, a story out of this book that I just wrote called A Safe Girl to Love, which is a collection of short stories. They're all about young trans women. Um, I'm going to read a story that, part of a story, a couple excerpts that I haven't um, read yet, um, uh, which is a story called Winning, and it is set in Eugene, Oregon, um, out in the Northwest, um, and it is about a girl and her mom. It's 
going to start at the beginning, so. He's shivering, Zoe thought, as she came in Robin's bedroom and saw his tall, muslin pudge body vibrating on the bed, blanket on the floor. She made to tuck the blanket back over him when she saw his face was contorted and his lips were moving like waves. She said, hey, and softly rocked his shoulder. Robin gasped, then his face turned instantly blithe. Hey, I'm sorry to wake you. It's okay, he said. He stretched and his boxers made a ruffling noise in the sheets. You leaving, he said. Yeah, she said. Thanks for letting me crash. Definitely. Boy, he yawned. I feel fucked up. Robin finished most of a magnum last night. Zoe'd had two glasses and switched to milk. She loved milk. She giggled and said awe and must his wavy brown hair. It was silly, she realized, walking outside and zipping her hoodie up over her dress. But she had forgotten that boys even had nightmares at all. It was mid-November when in the Pacific Northwest the panorama of clouds stopped flirting with the sky and moved in and set their parking brakes until May. A soft mist patter of rain was coming down as Zoe walked down the motel-like stairs of Robin's complex, then over to Eugene Station to take the 66 bucks north. She got on and texted her best friend Julia back in New York. Hi, she said, you're beautiful and I miss you to fucking pieces. When she got off the bus and walked up to Ira's Road, the rain had stopped, but the sky was still an ocean, a pearl gray. Zoe hated this. Humans aren't supposed to go months with all their sunlight broken, she thought. She had actually loved the winters in New York. Everyone there complained about gray, but to Zoe, New York had been sunny and bright. Back at her mom's, the boxes in the kitchen hadn't moved. There was a note on the counter which said, I've gone to the farmer's market one last time. I need everything out of your room tonight. Well, that was a new request. She still had a week to stay here, but whatever. She went into her room and resumed clearing out her shit. You can build up so much stuff when you have a room and a house you don't actually live in, she thought. And Zoe had always been a pack rat, even as a teenager. She would save a lot of the things that she thought regular families saved for their kids. But she dumped most of that stuff now, though, and there were only a few boxes left, orderly seas of social studies papers, choir programs, stuff like that. Sandy came home as Zoe was mashing a basketball-sized paper wad into the recycling. I bought some fruit for you, her mother said. I'm not hungry, said Zoe. Don't give me that. Have you eaten? I don't want any fruit, thanks. Sandy washed a bag of Bartlett pears and plunked it dripping on the counter. She put her elbows beside the bag and massaged her eyes. Better to tell me the truth, don't you think? Ever since Zoe transitioned, Sandy had become convinced that her daughter would develop an eating disorder, though Zoe was eating as little as ever. No thanks, Mom, Zoe said. I'm not hungry. Zoe, Sandy said, the last thing I want to do is have to make you eat. It's not like I like having this conversation. Sandy was trans, too. Zoe had come out to her exactly 18 months ago on the phone from her Brooklyn apartment after she'd already been on hormones for a while. She'd meticulously, she'd meticulously taken steps to avoid telling her, and when she had, her mother had cried and cried and cried. Her phone pulsed and Zoe saw it, another text from Julia. You're beautiful, I miss you. And Zoe picked up the biggest pear and took a gargantuan bite. What do you need help with next, she asked. Sandy had done a lot to have Zoe with Sandy's wife at the time, Taya. This was back in the mid 80s. Sandy'd sent a forged death certificate to the clinic where she'd banked her sperm, who then sent the samples to a friend of Taya's, a nurse practitioner who then helped with inseminating. This was on the plains where Sandy and Taya had grown up. They'd moved to Oregon to have Zoe, who was born downtown in an apartment off 8th Avenue. Zoe loved this story and she never got tired of telling it to her friends back east. She liked to say that she had been born loved. Though Taya had left both of them when Zoe was eight and Sandy had not always been the most stable of mothers, Zoe had always felt acre of love. Can you go through the closet in the spare room? Sandy said. No problem, said Zoe. Hey, have another pair if you want it. They're completely yours, Sandy called after her. Zoe didn't respond, so she got out pita bread and hummus and went to her desk in the living room to do paperwork. She passed well, her mother did. Zoe had always admired for her that, and now that she herself had transitioned, she especially admired it now. In the old days, no one had known about Sandy, and with her being 6'1 and broad-shouldered and poor, Zoe thought it really couldn't have been easy. I always wore jeans, Sandy told Zoe once when Zoe was 17. It had been the fifth anniversary of Sandy's bottom surgery, and she'd been unusually talkative about the subject. I always wore jeans, she said, almost never skirts or dresses, because just in people's heads, subconsciously, the idea of trannies wearing jeans doesn't mesh. Zoe had listened to this raptly. They said I looked mannish, Sandy giggled, but they never thought I was a man. I tricked him. And she sounded like she was gloating. She said, you know, they just passed me off as some big earthy dyke. Well, you know, that's okay. From very early in her childhood, Zoe knew that Sandy had once lived as a man. Neither of her mothers had hidden it from her, but it was also understood to be a buried subject, something gravely serious Zoe was never supposed to talk or ask about. I did have some really pretty dresses, Sandy had said in that conversation, but I had to be very careful about wearing them. I just had to be careful. They moved out of the apartment off 8th when Zoe was in third grade. It had been right after Taya left and right when Sandy got her job with the county. That's when they got one of the few bungalows left along Ayers on the north edge of town just shy of the city line. Sandy was from the country and she missed the stars, she said. She missed the stars and the quiet.
skimming to another section more middle way through the story. Okay, so now Zoe has just gotten a job at a call center doing surveys, and this is her first day at work. On the third call, she stuttered a bit because the man on the phone, a surly dairy farmer outside Pacific City, sounded exactly like a man she'd known back in New York, a guy with layered blonde hair who ran a bar in Williamsburg, wallpapered with covers of Gaddis books. They had gone out for dinner, then out dancing. The man had been amazingly charming, gentlemanly. She'd accepted all the drinks he bought her, and back at his place he'd begun squeezing her nipples and slipping his hands south, and her last memory was of mushily shaking her head. Wait, hold on, I like you, I want you, a slight, wait, and when she woke up she was on his bed, alone, and he was at his desk on his computer, and both sides of her bottom had a dull, vomit spurring ache. How many milk giving cows did you say? said Zoe now. I'm sorry, including heifers that are not yet fifty two, said the man. Now do you have it this time or do I need to repeat it again? You tell me here. And Zoe said, Yes, of course, of course, sir. And by nine o'clock Zoe had covered the scratch paper on her office desk with black and white penciled swirls and shapes, crisscrossing paisleys and hectograms and triple helixes and the outlines of faces. Some of the faces resembled her mom. Her mom. Zoe had always seen her mother as dimly gorgeous. She had short, coiffed, ash blonde hair like Sharon Stone in Casino without the rat tail. She wore blue or gray skinny jeans, tank tops with shiny satin edges that, edges that showed off lightly muscled swimmer's arms and long earrings that skittered around her collarbone wherever she moved her head. In winter, she wore cable knit zippered hoodies. Zoe, on the other hand, kept her hair black like dresses with stripes or polka dots, see through blouses over camisoles, the patterned sweater tights in winter. She sped through tubes of eyeliner and lipstick. Sandy maybe used a little mascara once in a while. Even as Zoe took no part of her own style from her, if she had to be honest, she dressed a bit like her other, Meyer, other mother, Taya, who now spoiled her with clothes on visits. Zoe did admire the way Sandy looked. She admired a lot about her mother, really. She admired the way she hadn't hid from Zoe the pain of Taya leaving her, but she rarely badmouthed or castigated Taya herself. And given that Taya had departed with a load of their money and a note including the words, like anyone else would have loved you, she would have had plenty of reason. She admired how Sandy treated Zoe's boyfriends in high school, the ones she dragged up from South at the U of O, because no gay boys were out at her own school, and how Sandy welcomed them and cooked for them, even when sometimes they were snotty to her. She admired the sex talk Sandy had given her when she was really young, before puberty. Sandy had told her, now, this is a thing that teenagers and adults like to do, and they get to do. Kids don't. It's not a kid thing. You won't even want to do it, and you shouldn't. But this is what'll happen, what happen when you're older, and it can be wonderful. But it is important you're safe. There's a safe way to do it and an unsafe way. And it's like driving without a seatbelt, where if something bad happens, you can die. But if you're safe, it gives you freedom. You can't imagine the happiness and the freedom. When you're older, I will help you, and we can talk about it. This is something I want you to do right, and it's something I want you to look forward to. I want this to be a good and healthy part of your life, she had said. And Zoe really admired that, especially when she found out about all of Sandy's friends who died during what she'd only for referred to as a plague. Zoe had remembered a few of them from when she was a kid, but only faintly, and only a few. Thanks for your time, sir, Zoe said to her last call. Yeah, yeah, good night, ma'am, the man grumbled. Zoe folded the drawings she made, thought of sticking them in her bag, then dropped them in the trash. Not the recycling, the trash. So New York, huh? The supervisor asked as they left their building together after the work. After work, <laughs> sorry. Why'd you come here? Zoe was really tired of answering that question, and lately she'd just been snapping, I'm helping my mom, in a tone that made everyone think her mom had a deadly illness and needed Zoe to tend to her last days or something. It usually got people to leave her alone. But when she said that now, her supervisor, super, <laughs> too much coffee. <laughs> but when she said that now, her supervisor just said, huh, do you like it here though? Like, do you think you want to stay here in Eugene? Zoe considered how to answer that to a stranger. Well, I grew up here, she said softly. Walking down dark and slick Willamette Street with her hoodie up in the sprinkle mist rain, it occurred to her that she'd walked these streets late often since coming back, but hadn't been propositioned or harassed once in Eugene, or been made to feel it safe in any way, really. When Zoe was a kid, she thought she lived in a great town. She thought no place was better than this little city, a term Taya had liked to use. Oh, this little city. Zoe didn't like the neighborhood they'd ended up in, a weird little bumpkin and religious yuppie enclave, but she loved downtown, and she loved the U of O, and she even loved the dumb political battles that played out in the city. Bike paths through the Catholic school, the cross on Skinner's Butte, where to build a new hospital, all the little clashes between right and left, hippies and Mormon, Mormons, developers and enviros. It had felt like that stupid idea of what America was supposed to be, and no one was from there. It was a place 
place you moved to. Even from middle school on, it seemed like being born in town put her in the minority. And when she was a teenager, leaving just didn't occur to her. Like, why would you do that if you were lucky enough to be from here? She thought when she left home, she'd just get a room in a house back downtown by the Wow Hall and go be a stupid duck for four years, then get a job and a little house of her own, then there she be. There she be, as her mom would say in one of her few kept Midwesternisms. Zoe was rarely bitter about being trans. If you needed to believe in the possibility of unbitter trans women, Zoe would be your girl. But she knew she wouldn't have left if it hadn't been for that. She would have stayed. She would have gone to the country fair, signed on with a co-op, checked in on her mom, lived the beautiful new liberal American life. It had been so close. Hell, on the face of it, the town in its current era had been designed specifically for someone like her. Like, who else if not for the fag kid of a woman like Sandy, queer and transplanted and a hippie to boot? Zoe had really always thought it was a great town. She'd never hated it growing up, ever, ever, ever. But she knew that staying meant a boy future, a pretend to be cis future. She didn't have the strength to figure out the gender thing around everyone she'd known. And she'd known that in part from her mom. You couldn't transition and keep everything else in your life the same. It couldn't happen. She tested it a bit one summer by telling a few friends about Sandy, the one she thought would react the best, and the looks on their faces, especially her boyfriends, of revulsion, of horror, the things they said about her mother. One just said simple dumb stuff like, oh gross, she's your dad, that is fucked up, that is fucked up. And another said, ha, huh, well, she was too pretty to actually be real anyway. Hey, maybe he'll be a penguin next, huh? Though the worst was a girl, a close friend, who looked ashen and said, you know, it sucks. I knew she had problems, but I still looked up to her as a strong woman. I thought I had this strong woman in my life. I thought you had this strong mother. Zoe clammed up, about telling, clammed up about telling anyone after that. She didn't even mention it to Frankie, an old best friend of hers. And so when fall came and she applied for and squeaked into a fancy school on the East Coast, she saw for the first time in her town a void, endless black. She would be forever grateful she grew up there, but the future we saw was, she saw was for some willowy gay kid, lovely, but not her. And then everyone's fucking attitudes about trans stuff changed so quickly after a few years. Chaz, Thomas Beatty, all those fucks. Had she been born five years later, she thought sometimes she might have felt like she could have stayed. So, Zoe was bitter about that. She looked away from her supervisor and adjusted her bag. I don't mind it, she said quietly. There's a lot of worse places to be. Oh, geez, said the supervisor. You have no idea. I love it here. And he started talking about his hometown in Arizona and how there were grocery stores and bars here in Eugene he just loved. And you'd never find that where he was from. And just even the people were so nice. Like, they gave a shit about being humans here, you know? He had gray eyes and they kind of sparkled as he talked. Zoe said, uh-huh totally, and decided to picture this guy Al lubed and naked until he got to the bus station, where she returned some texts and her supervisor got on the 24, going somewhere south. Thank you. <laughs>